<clears throat> Welcome everyone to our event today. Retail investors shake up Wall Street. What's next? I'm John Jacobs, Executive Director for the Center for Financial Markets and Policy here at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business. The center's efforts focus on the workings of global finance and its role in solving societal problems. We accomplish this by advancing global dialogue on the ways in which financial markets impact society, focusing on issues such as public and private markets, ESG, and fintech. We conduct original research that impact practice and policy. We convene conferences and events in Washington, D.C. and around the world, both virtually and in person, for scholars, market participants, policymakers, investors, and corporate leaders. We provide a nonpartisan forum for solution-oriented discussion, and we cultivate students to become principled leaders with a global mindset to be in service to business and society. My colleagues at the center are Anna Cormis, Alberto Rossi, and Rena Agarwal. Rena is not only the director of the center, but she founded the center 10 years ago. Their tireless efforts have led to today's event. We have a terrific panel today, and it's my pleasure to turn it over to our moderator and Georgetown alum, Guy Adani. Thank you, John, and thanks everybody for joining. And Professor Agarwal, thank you obviously so much for, for doing this. I appreciate it. Uh, we have a great panel. You can see in front of me, we have Chester Scott, we have James Angel, I think we have Peter Kyle with us today, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And we turned this around pretty quick, Professor, as you know, and I want to start with you. GameStop is on the front. I mean, we've talked about it on CNBC now for the last two weeks, but not only that, um, and I'm not saying this to be a wise guy, I was on Australian TV a week or so ago. I've been on WFAN, which is a sports talk radio show in New York, and it's simulcast across the country because this story has far-reaching tentacles and effects on what's going on. So, Professor, I just want to start with you. What happened here, in your opinion, in terms of GameStop and all the ancillary things around it? Um, sure, Guy. Uh, again, thank you for moderating, and thank you to all the panelists for joining us on this uh, very important and timely topic. And uh, in some ways, this started before GameStop and uh, even before COVID, right? Uh, broadly, it's about democratization of uh, the markets, of finance more broadly. So on the one hand, it's a great thing that uh, finance and the markets are becoming accessible to the retail investor. And uh, they were accessible through your mutual funds, through uh, retirement, 401k accounts, et cetera. But this kind of gives the retail investor a direct link. But we've also learned that the retail investor needs to uh, understand a lot of things. There are a lot of things about what, is, what are all the fees associated? And, uh, and we have new trading platforms coming up. Uh, what does uh, payment for order flow mean? So there are a whole lot of issues that, uh, that uh, I, I think regulators, policymakers, and market participants need to focus on. And uh, th these are issues, uh, uh, it, it's going to take some time to figure it out, right? Some things we know, what happened to the price of game stock? It went from uh, uh, a 52 week low is $2.57 to the 52 week high is $483, or, uh, right? And volume increased tremendously, but we still don't know a lot of things. And I think the regulators uh, are going to need some time to analyze the data and see what is the role of different market participants in this episode, but then what do we learn from it in the future? And James, I think you're on mute, but I know you put a piece out and that I actually had an opportunity to read. So I know you have some thoughts. That was pretty good the way I did that, by the way. See, I did you're on mute. So I know you have some thoughts on this, James. Why don't you sort of share those with our audience? Well, thank you. I mean, <clears throat> what we've seen is that our uh, market structure worked but there are a lot of leaks in our market plumbing that need fixing. And in particular, uh, what we've seen is a big spike in prices where the stock price went to absurd levels. And guess what? When that happens, there are a lot of innocent bystanders who get hurt. Think of the retirement investor in their index fund whose index fund just happened to have to buy GameStop at 300. So 
we need to look at the public policies that have led to these kind of spikes. And in particular, we need to look at some of the imperfections in our stock lending market, which suffers from a big lack of transparency. We also need to think about the way we clear and settle stocks. Waiting two days to settle a trade is an archaic artifact mm -hmm. in the days when we threw paper certificates around lower Manhattan. <laughs> so we, need, we need to basically you know, look at this, modernize our architecture, modernize some of our rules like 204, 15C3-3, and a few other rules to basically plug these leaks in our market plumbing. Peter, I know you have some thoughts on this as well. I, I, I agree with uh, what Jim said. I think there are areas that we need to look at. Um, I, I think the uh, regulators uh, should look at whether there was any price manipulation here. You know, maybe there was, maybe there wasn't. Uh, we don't uh, have all the facts in, but price manipulation can take different forms. Uh, one form it can take is uh, telling uh, other people who trust you to buy when you're actually selling behind their back. You know, that, mm -hmm. that, that sounds somewhat fraudulent to me, uh, but it's, it's certainly behavior that if I were a regulator, I would look to see if that occurred. But another different kind of behavior that Jim alluded to is um, uh, misbehavior in the stock lending market. Um, if you were sitting on collateral and not lending it out for the purpose of driving the price of the stock up so that you or your uh, maybe some co-conspirators could sell it. Uh, that's a, another form of manipulation that I think the uh, regulators should uh, take a look at. And, um, and we, I'm sorry, Peter, go ahead. That, that, I'm finished. Yeah, no, and I think you bring up some great points. We're going to dive deep into these. And, and Chester, I want to ask you from your perch, you know, we all have, I'm sure we all have similar views, but I'm sure we all have different views as well. What's your takeaway over the last couple of weeks? Well, I, 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 would, I, would, I would emphasize in, in part uh, the importance of, of improving uh, the, risk, the risk management aspects of, of, of our system. Um, why, 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 uh, why, why is there credit? Why, why is there credit risk on the part of intermediaries um, to the extent that they um, require prepayment? Um, if they do require prepayment. Um, of the purchase of the securities, and if they're willing to restrict uh, the use, the use, the use of leverage, and I, and I think uh, the nature, you know, I think in principle there 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 ought not to be there ought not to be um, credit risk there if that were be, if that were basically be, better managed um, through tighter um, delivery requirements. I, I also think that this has really brought out. Um, the issue of the conflict of interest between broker, between broker, brokers and their customers, um, the illusion of free commissions, um, the myth of free commissions, I, I think is something that ought to be exploded. Um, the issue of payment for order flow and related issues that make take and take make pricing and the distortions and routing and the side payments that brokers get. Th this this is I think not received enough attention. Um, from the from the secure from the securities um, regulators, and I think is a very important issue going forward. Well, it's certainly going to get. I'm sure it's if it hasn't yet, it will now. And we're going to talk about Gary Gensler and some of the other things going up. But Reed, I want to ask you. I mean, I believe that market structure is something you've been focused on for years. I mean that that there's a there's a tectonic shift going on. I mean the ground is moving under everybody's feet, whether they realize it or not. So you might have to change some of the curriculum at Georgetown University or the University of Maryland based on exactly what we've just seen over the last couple of weeks. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, and uh, to some extent, we have already been changing our curriculum, right? Uh, there are a number of different things that all uh, several universities, uh, Carnegie Mellon and Maryland and Georgetown, we've been doing. and. Uh, Part of it is the curriculum, the kinds of courses that we are offering. So we are offering many more courses in machine learning and AI and FinTech and blockchain. Uh, so students really need to be up to speed in this. This is the future. Uh, then it's also what's happening outside the curriculum in terms of uh, experiential learning, right? The students actually trying out uh, investing on their own and, uh, and living with some of this on a real-time basis. So at Georgetown, we have uh, several 
student-run investment funds. And I'm, I'm sure they're paying a lot of attention to this. Uh, and then there are going to be cases that are going to be written up about uh, some of what's happening in the market right now that we'll end up using in the classroom. But, uh, but it's about the markets evolve and we at business schools have to keep up with those evolving markets to educate our students. And Chester, you, you alluded to this. We have a question from the audience. And so if you see me leaning forward, it's because I'm reading these questions. So I apologize to the audience. And I want encourage you to ask questions vis-a-vis -vis the Q&A or the chat. But Chester, the question is for you, what is the illusion of free commissions? And what's the alternative avenues for collections of commissions on a free trading platform? So, so the, the intermediary, intermediaries in part are, are selling the order flow of of, cust of customers to um, market market to um, some of the market some of the market makers and uh, potentially the incentive the incentives therefore of the uh, broker is not aligned with the with the client so there's other revenue that's being received and it's leading to distortions um, that are potentially more costly for the for the for the client uh, than if the client simply um, Paid, paid directly. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. And, and James, I'm going to ask you this question as well, but Pete, I want to start with you. Who are the different players in this saga to the extent that you want to go down that rabbit hole? And, you know, what, can, what do you know? What do we know? What are your thoughts about their activities? I, I'll give you what little uh, I know. A lot of this is conjecture because I haven't actually looked at data that describes exactly who the players are. But a big trend in recent years is that retail investors have become a larger fraction of the trading uh, that takes place on Wall Street. Um, and a, and a retail investors tend to be momentum traders, I think, um, at least the ones that trade a lot. And they, in my opinion, tend to be momentum traders with the wrong time horizon for the momentum. You know, they'll either be too fast or too slow, but typically too slow with whatever trend uh, they, uh, is, 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 is involved. Um, but the other big players on uh, Wall Street are the institutional investors. Uh, many of whom are pension uh, funds that, that manage billions of dollars and have professionalized uh, staffs uh, to do this. And then you have hedge funds, uh, some of whom, uh, uh, some of which uh, go short uh, stocks. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you uh, put it all together, um, you, you've got a market where lots of people are trading. But then not to be forgotten is the fact that many investors, including retail investors like me, uh, don't trade much. Um, we, we index, which means we have passive management. So when I look at uh, GameStop and uh, the um, issues here, you see massive numbers of retail investors buying. You see a, a subset of uh, hedge funds that might be rather specialized in shorting this type of stock, selling it short. You see a lot of pension funds who are probably long only investors, and they may by accident or design own some of these companies, but it's not a major part of their a business model, and they're not going to short it, but they, although they may sell it. Um, so uh, it, it seems like there was a, a kind of difference of opinion between the large numbers of retail investors buying and limited number of hedge funds selling, and the retail investors temporarily drove the price to very high levels. Um, I should say that it, market participants are protected by uh, short sellers. So we, we uh, from paying too high a price, and maybe the protection mechanism didn't work totally efficiently this time right. around, but maybe some of uh, Chester or Jim uh, have more to add on this. And, and I want to come back to that because I think you just touched on something that's extraordinarily important that I want to really drill down on. But Jim, I want to ask you in terms of, you know, the participants, we've talked the Reddit crowd and the Wall Street bets crowd and the, the people that are angry at the establishment and we're taking down, you know, the man or whatever euphemism you want to put in there. And, and again, there's going to be a lot written about this, not only in the next couple of weeks, but over the next couple of years. It's that fascinating a story. But, you know, Jim, your thoughts about the participants in this before we drill down into are short sellers necessary? Jim. Oh, well, I want to violently agree with Pete about how short sellers can protect us. And they do a lot of really good things. Now, you know, for example, you know, the price of the ETF that a lazy guy like me buys is going to be laser locked under the price of the underlying basket. Why? because arbitrageurs have the ability to buy low and short high when the price of the ETF deviates from the basket of stocks. So even low frequency spec non-speculators like me 
benefit from the activity of arbitrageurs and they need to be able to go short. We depend on market makers to be able to go short to help provide liquidity at other times when they run out of inventory. So they also protect us you know, from overpriced stocks. And remember, an overpriced stock is nobody's friend. If a stock is selling for more than the present value of its future cash flows, it's just locking in losses for all investors going forward. So when a stock goes to an unrealistic level, it's not a good thing for anybody. Mm -hmm. So we depend upon short sellers to bring information to the market because we want the market to reflect all the information, the bad news as well as the good, and the sooner the better. Yeah. We'd also like to get back to what Chester was saying about free commissions. What a lot of people don't really appreciate is that brokers have changed their business model from that of a broker to that of a bank. If you think about what a bank does, you deposit your money, they lend it out at a spread, and they charge you for other services they try to sell you. That's what brokers do now. You deposit your money and your securities, they lend them out, and they try to upsell you on other services. Just like the bank gives you the free bill paying because it's cheap, the brokers have found that the trading is so cheap, they can give it to you for free. But, so Guy, I would, uh, just, go ahead, Reed, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I just want to add that uh, I think one thing we have to be really careful about is uh, the stock market is not a game, all right? Mm, and, well. Uh, it should not be treated as a game. And uh, if uh, retail investors are getting more into the market, we've got to make sure that they don't view this as a game. Somehow it's not being marketed as a game. I mean, this is people's real savings, right? It might be for retirement. Uh, it might be for all kinds of things. This is investing. This is not right. just uh, uh, playing a game and, uh, and uh, having fun with that. So you, you know that I agree with you 100%, but you see what's in my hand right now, which is probably in the hand of the 600 or so participants we have on this webinar. And what I'll tell you, and, I, and, and again, under the, under the cover that I agree with everything you're saying, but I also believe that it's become gamified. The stock market has been gamified for a number of different reasons, not least of which the fact that you could do it off your iPhone or whatever device you're using. And oh, by the way, in a zero commission environment, it's made it obviously very cheap for these people to do it. And then one more aspect that makes this thing very fascinating, again, just my op opinion, Rena, and I'm sure the other panelists have opinions as well that I'd love to hear, but when sports went away last year and sports didn't go away for a week, two weeks, they went away for months, and people that had been historically betting on these games, and let's put it out there because that's a huge business in the United States and overseas, they didn't have any place to go. And somebody named Dave Portnoy, say what you want about him. There's a lot of pros, a lot of cons, but I think he realized that, wait a second, what is the outlet for my client base? And I think he said, you know what? I can do this in the stock market and I can gamify the stock market. And he introduced tens of thousands, if not millions of people to the stock market in a form of you know what, if not gambling on a Nick game or the Maryland Terrapin game, I'm going to gamble on General Electric or Tesla or GameStop. So I think that genie's out of the bottle, Professor. I'd love to hear your thoughts, and then I want to hear from the guys. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, go I, ahead. I, I, maybe I, maybe I, I can I, I, well, Jim, go ahead first, Jim. You want to share Okay. Yeah, I'm going to respectfully disagree with my dear colleague, Rena, in that I don't see there's anything wrong with somebody scratching their gaming itch in the market, I think it's a lot more socially beneficial than buying lottery tickets. Because your typical Robinhood customer has a very small account and they're learning by doing. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they get some entertainment out of it is actually great. We depend upon our capital markets to bring in capital to help support growing businesses. And well, we that's... depend upon our capital markets to be basically bringing in people who are willing to bear risk well, who's willing to bear risk? The gamers are. So this actually means, yeah, they're getting some entertainment out of it, but they're bringing in information, they're bringing in capital, they're bringing in liquidity, and they're learning by doing. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I don't think we should have to you know, say, oh, you have to have a, a bad experience. No, it's okay 
to actually you know, enjoy what's going on in the markets. But be honest with yourself. If you don't know where your edges or why you know more than everybody else, if you're in it for the entertainment, don't expect to make money at it. Fair enough, Chester. Well, I, well, I, what, I, what I'd like to add is as an, inv as an investor in the markets, but as an investor who at least, except when I have an especially good idea, basically invests in, in, diverse, in diversified passive vehicles, um, you know, I'm perfectly happy if there are market participants who are systematically losing, lose, losing. I'm perfectly happy as an investor on the opposite side if there are folks who want to simply give away their money. Um, um, you know, but it, but it strikes me it doesn't serve their it, it strikes me it doesn't it doesn't serve uh, their interests and and I think as a society we've probably done a poor job with respect to investor education um, in in this regard the fact that many people view this as a as a as a as a as a game um, as opposed to in, investing um, for their for their future whether it's for a child's uh, education whether whether it's for their retirement savings and the like and the the, the precepts of of investing are actually uh, this is very different than um, brain surgery the uh -huh. precepts of, of investing sensibly are very very simple um, they can be taught they can be taught in an hour and they involve a few simple ideas uh, market market efficiency diversification competition um, um, these are these are these are actually not such complex uh, kind of ideas, you know. And but obviously, it also takes it takes uh, individuals with different perspectives to make a market. And yeah. So to the extent yeah. that here investors have uh, some of them are enthusiastic and they think the shorts got it wrong, I think that's okay. Um, I think it's okay that there's forces pushing against the shorts. Although I'm a big fan for the similar reasons to the other panelists, I'm a huge fan of shorting. Um, I view I viewed and, and when I was served as chief economist at the at the SEC, I thought one of the most important um, uh, roles um, the SEC, of course, is focused on investor protection. And it seemed to me at the heart of investor protection is in, is encouraging short, shorting. Um, but if there's forces that push against that, I also think that's that's okay. It takes diverse views to make a market. Right, Rena. I know you have thoughts, but Pete, your your sort of thoughts on all this. I know you've been well, listening patiently. Well, I've I've actually spent a lot of my career modeling markets uh, using the technique of game theory, so modeling them as games. But I think what Rena is referring to is not the use of game theory to model markets or even to model competition among firms, but gamification is exploiting some tendency in human nature that we like to 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 trade. And actually, it's in the wealth. Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776, and he said that something to the effect that the tendency to truck and barter is part of human nature, is deeply in ingrained in us. Um, and I think the, the uh, retail people who trade stocks have to realize it's not like you're betting on the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl is a game where you're not a player. You're not going to get hurt if uh, someone tackles someone uh, violently. But in the stock market, uh, you are a player. And if you step out on the field of game stock uh, to play that game, uh, trading game stock, uh, you might get injured um, and injured pretty seriously because there are bigger players out there. They're better than you are. And they maybe know more about what they're doing than you do. So right. uh, as Chester said, this, the optimal solution for someone who is not the best player uh, is to minimize physical contact, um, and that would mean uh, investing in diversified mutual funds and not trading them that often. So, Rena, I know, you, I know you heard some of these comments. I'm curious as sort of your feedback on that. Yeah, so I, I guess I'm thinking um, about society in general and more broadly and how, to, uh, how we should protect. So I'm all for liquidity. I'm all for access to more capital, but, uh, but, but I think... And I'm all for uh, financial literacy. I think the things that Chester mentioned are uh, extremely important to make sure. But I do worry about retail investors who might not be educated fully about the implications, mm -hmm. about the consequences, and they're just doing it for a ride. Uh, as long as they're aware of the risks that they're taking, as uh, Pete has mentioned, th th then it's fine. But uh, but I, d I don't want trading platforms to attract our biases in such a way 
that uh, it really ends up hurting us, right? It's a, it's a time, I'm really for democratization of finance and the markets, and I do hope retail participants can uh, can come into the market in a bigger ways. It's it's fascinating that you you know you what you're talking about, Professor, is you know protecting, and I'm putting words in your mouth, so I apologize, but I'm paraphrasing now. You know, protecting these participants from themselves. And the feedback that I get, and if you follow me on Twitter, I mean, it's a dark place, but some of the comments that I get, I can't say here, but what I will tell you just to clean them up a little bit is we don't want your protection. We know exactly what we're getting ourselves into. And it's sort of this new regime versus an old regime thing. And, and I don't know, maybe the world is changing. So Chester, you know, I want to bring it back to you real quick. And we have a question from one of our audience members. How far can you push the idea of market democratization? Will market work well without fiduciary agents? I mean, it's interesting. We continue to push out that risk curve, Chester. Any thoughts on that question? Well, well how, how, how will the markets work without fiduciaries? Uh, well, I think some people, some people, I don't think we're going to ban, I don't think we should, I don't think we will, or we should ban fiduciaries. Um, if, if people want to want to trade on their own, uh, obviously they have the right they, they have the right to do so. I, I indicated before that I'd like to be on the other side of at least some of the people um, trade, right. trading 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 on their on their, on their own. A little a little less excited about being on the other side of the fiduciaries, except 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 either when I think I have a better idea, except when I'm persuaded that I have a better idea than those fiduciaries, which a few times I have, and. Or um, when when I can simply hold the average the average portfolio um, and undercut undercut those fiduciaries because I'm not paying them eighty basis points a year. No, and I appreciate that, and, and I'm, I apologize again for going back and forth leaning because I'm reading these questions. We have another audience uh, question, Jim. This is for you. You mentioned about the 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 Neanderthal two three day settlement, so. The question is, what do you propose as the best solution for real-time settlement? Is blockchain the ultimate solution, Jim? Well, I'm a big fan of blockchain, and I believe the uh, Australia Stock Exchange is already using it for its post-trade settlement. But regardless of what kind of database we use, because a blockchain is basically just a database, we need to shorten the settlement cycle. My favorite equation in all of finance is time equals risk. And we don't need to have collateral tied up for two days. We should move to T plus one and then T plus midnight. And I think there are a lot of good technical reasons why we should not do gross real-time settlement trade by trade because of the netting that occurs in our settlement system. That might be getting a little bit too deep into the weeds, but if we shorten the settlement cycle, we eliminate the need for a lot of collateral and we eliminate a lot of counterparty risk. Rena, you talk a lot about, again, market structure and, and part of this market structure. And this is a question from uh, Andy Christopher. I'm going to use his name because he put it out there. What would be the impact on retail investors, in your opinion, if payment for order flow was eliminated or somehow restricted? Yeah, I, I think that has to be looked at very carefully. Uh, and really what the retail investor needs to know is right now they're focused on zero commissions, right? But what are all the different kinds of hidden fees, payment for order flow, all of that uh, the retail investor needs to understand in a, an easier form, form so that they can see that there's more than just zero commissions that's involved and how they might be impacted. And payment for order flow would be one of the things to look at. Uh, and uh, it, it definitely needs to be looked at, but I, I don't think I can say right now that it's absolutely bad. Is it absolutely good? Or what disclosure is definitely needed uh, in that regard? Pete, this question's for you, because um, I think this is right up your alley. Please address, this is from an audience member, by the way, please address the degree to which leverage at all different levels created the liquidity crisis at Robinhood and probably fueled the flames of a GameStop to Professor Agarwal's point went from $12 to $483. Okay, well, leverage in our financial system takes uh, two forms. Uh, one of the one form is when you're long an asset, you will uh, borrow money to finance your uh, position. And uh, that might be a margin account. If you're talking about stocks, it's a mortgage. If you're talking about buying a home. So uh, most people, and, and I would argue a certain amount of leverage is a good idea because you want people to be able uh, to buy homes. 
um, and certain types of uh, financial organizations like banks need leverage in order to um, be able to uh, invest in, in their assets with deposits as, as liabilities. The other type of leverage, though, <clears throat> is the leverage you get when traders go short. Um, that, that's kind of the reverse of leverage, but it's still leverage. Um, leverage times, times kind of minus one. And the difficulty with leverage is that when things start moving against levered investors in a big mm -hmm. way, uh, the amount of uh, wealth they have or the amount of uh, net asset value that they have in their accounts start shrinking and they have to start covering their positions or reducing their positions. So in a stock margin account, when you start losing enough money, eventually you're going to have to sell out your positions. And that will push prices even further uh, when pr falling prices got you in that trouble in the first place. And if you're right. short, it's the same thing, it, but in reverse, as prices rise, you're losing uh, you're losing. Uh, assets, uh, net asset value, you eventually have to cover and you have to buy in your position. So we need to have the right balance of leverage in the market. We need some, but but not too much and, and not too little. Uh, in the uh, GameStop situation, it might be the case there were too few hedge funds <laughs> willing to uh, take short positions, or it might be the case that there was some type of uh, manipulation going on that made it impossible. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, and that's, you know, they're going to be, as I say, we're going to learn a lot more in the next couple of weeks. And maybe I should come to one of Jim's class and give a class and give a talk on negative gamma to your point. I'd be more than happy to do that because I could wax poetic. But Chester, this question is for you. It's from Dave Lauer. Uh, do you think regulators and legislators have been too focused on active day traders using discount brokers to the detriment of the actual retail people? who hold their wealth in mutual funds and pension plans, Chester? Well, I, th I, think, I, think leg I think legislators are probably not very well suited uh, to deal with some of the issues before us because a lot of the types of issues that we're talking about today are about the, the plumbing um, of, of, the, of the system. And uh, there was a, a very... Pro a very prominent uh, economist who was a former, former secretary of the treasury who recently was quoted as citing two politicians and said, when these politicians agree, maybe you wanna be on the opposite side. And I thought that was a very interesting um, mm -hmm. per, per, perspe per, perspe perspective. Um, you know, I, I, do, I do think that the, that, the, that the fundamental issues, I do think the fundamental issues for, for investors are, are, are about things like retirement fund investing and about the cost structures and the, and, and the, and the, and the like. But you know, I, I also think that a situation like this is a lens into our system because it, it shines a, a spotlight on what are some of the important imperfections. How can we have a better system of risk management? How can we have a better system of clearing? How can we reduce the conflicts of interest in the trading process. And this type of event shines a spotlight on, on all of these issues. I don't think it's necessarily directly the issues that the politicians uh, are, are talking about. You know, politicians are talking about things like, well, our market's too volatile. Um, well, you know, the, the volatility here, it's, it's transit, it was transitory volatility. And it, it sort of disappeared in a in a few days. Why why are they even talking about that? But I I'm, I am confident in our regul I am confident in our regulators and particularly the regulatory staff. I'm sure the regulatory staff will do a good autopsy of, mm -hmm. of these issues. And uh, especially because here I think the issues may even not even be so data intensive. Um, that the, the the issues may be about some of the basic mechanics. Um, of what was the nature of the collateral calls that Robinhood faced? How was Robinhood set up with respect to its collateral? Um, um, you know, why, why was its collateral inadequate? What, what does that sort of say about the way our, our system is designed? And I, and, and, I, and I suspect that the staff will be able to make pretty good headway on these issues and, and provide informed insights, uh, for example, for the, for, the, for, the, for the SEC commissioners. Uh, to sort of sort through and make make sensible judgments about. Reen, I know you have thoughts on that as well. Uh, yeah, so Bob, you know, I completely agree with what Chester is saying. I think there are going to be some issues that you can look at very quickly and come up with recommendations based on what worked and what didn't in terms of clearance and settlement. When can a Robinhood uh, 
decide they're going to stop trading or put restrictions on certain stocks and uh, for how long uh, and what, what do market participants know about that? You know, the one thing that uh, I think we have to pay a lot more attention to is the regulators have typically looked at data to, and analyzed the data to see what might have gone right or wrong. Uh, but the kind of data that we are going to be thinking about the future is different. It's going to be about what's coming through social media platforms and how mm -hmm. do you capture that? It's got, so it's going to be massive data and you're going to need machine learning and AI to work through that data. And, uh, and the other thing is, how do you quickly analyze that data? You can't wait months and months to figure out what happened. So, but, so I think the kind of data will change. Um, the old kind of data will continue to exist and we'll have the uh, consolidated uh, audit trail and all of those things, but we better be paying attention to this new kind of data and it's tons and tons of data and how to analyze it quickly. And it's, it's gonna be a whole new industry created on the back of exactly what you just mentioned, Rena. We have another question, Jim, this is right up your alley. And I know the panelists have some thoughts on this as do I, but this is from Eugenie, Jim, so get ready. How are market participants protected by short sellers? Jim. Oh, very easily. Let me start with a basic case. You, know, you buy an ETF, all right? Its price fluctuates according to supply and demand in the market, but you want its price to actually match the basket of stocks inside. So if the price of that ETF deviates from the price of the basket, the short sellers will buy low, short high, push the prices back together. They're basically like traffic cops. What if the stock gets too high? Again, when a stock gets to an absurd level, it's no good for anybody, let alone the retail investors who wander in, who get caught up in the excitement, and get left holding the bag. So by selling an overpriced stock, they tend to push its price back down closer to reality. Again, we want all the information out there incorporated in stock prices, the bad news as well as the good. Pete, thoughts? I, 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 I agree with Jim and I would add, if you look back at the dot-com bubble of the 1990s, there were many dot-com stocks that were selling at prices that looked back then like they were way above their fundamental value and they were, they were rather difficult to short. Um, and part of the a problem that occurred for the economy was that these firms raised a lot of capital and then deployed it probably very inefficiently, um, investing in all kinds of projects that didn't really pay off. And it left the investors in those stocks without much money. So the regulators are, uh, have an interest in, in protecting individual investors, but they also have an interest in making sure that capital in the economy is deployed efficiently and uh, uh, prices that reflect the actual fundamental value of a security um, do help capital get deployed more efficiently. Yeah, I, I happen to believe, not that my opinion matters for anything, but I happen to believe that short sellers play a vital role in market structure. Uh, if you think about it, if we had listened to short sellers about Enron, WorldCom, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, I could rattle them off. I mean, these people tend to do extraordinarily thoughtful work, and, and it's vital for the market. You take them out of the equation. And by the way, Citron Research, to the extent that you know who Andrew Left is, last week he basically came out and said he's throwing his hands up, saying he really can't do this anymore in this environment. So if you were to take that those players out of the market, and I use that term loosely, players, uh, you, you're basically taking out those speed bumps. And remember, when markets go down, and they go down a lot faster than they go up, folks, trust me, I've done this for 35 years, I know of what I speak, you take them out of the equation, a lot of times they're the buyer of last resort. And if they're not there, I actually think volatility is going to go up, not down, but that's just my opinion. Rena, this question is for you, so get ready. You understand this stuff better than most people. Um, Stock loan business, you know, what is stock loaning? How does it work? You know, borrowing, lending of stocks. Can you help our audience with that? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So the, yeah, it's an area in which I've uh, written quite a bit. And uh, so think about uh, your uh, ETF, your mutual fund, uh, anywhere where you hold stocks, they can lend out those securities. And when you lend out your securities, that organization is going to earn a fee, a lending fee on it. And uh, what we saw with GameStop was uh, 
short interest was 140%. So people think about, well, how can it be more than the shares that are outstanding on a float basis? And often what can happen is those shares can get lent out several times. So I lend out my shares to Chester. Now Chester has the right to those shares and it's possible he might lend them out again. So I'm earning a lending fee. So there's a benefit to lending out my securities, but there's really very little we know about this market. The information is not transparent. And uh, one of the things I've written on is uh, if, I, if I lend out my shares, I don't have voting rights. So uh, I've given my voting rights to the borrower. And uh, if some important issue is coming up that we need to vote on, I don't have those voting rights. I mean, the good news is uh, our research actually finds that uh, institutional investors, they pull back their lending just before uh, the record date, just before voting happens so that they can vote their shares. But in general, I'd say there just isn't enough uh, information about what are the policies. The policies tend to be sort of vague uh, a little bit about when, um, you know, your Fidelity or Vanguard or whoever else might lend their shares out. And uh, are they actually voting? When are they actually lending out and not voting? So I think around this whole area, the regulators need more data on who the lenders are and what, what is going on. And the market needs more information. Jim, I know you have thoughts. Yes. One of the problems when we have these price spikes where prices go to absurd levels is they often become very hard to borrow. Now, it turns out we have two sets of rules for how brokers can lend out shares based on whether somebody took out a loan from the broker or not. And this added complexity makes it very hard for brokers to lend out so-called fully paid shares. So if you have shares in a margin account and you borrowed from the broker, the broker has one set of rules. If you repay the margin loan, the broker has a totally different set of rules under 15C3-3 about how and when they can lend out the shares. This makes it really hard to do. Now, I would love it if my broker could lend out the fully paid shares in my IRA account because I'd like to take the money from the short sellers because they have to pay rent for those shares. So I think we need to modernize SEC Rule 15C3-3 and have one set of rules for lending out shares from customer accounts. It, and one, one, one important aspect of, of the lack of transparency in the lending market um, is that lending, lending fees wind, wind up potentially being very high, but the incentives to lend uh, at the customer level are not necessarily so strong because we, we believe that there are huge intermediary spreads that basically come about because this, because this market is not very transparent. And I, and I think um, moving, moving toward a much more transparent lending market would be a major reform that the SEC should initiate. Uh, and so uh, looking at GameStop is kind of interesting where the so-called utilization has been, was 100% for uh, some time, which means all the shares that were available to lend out, they were borrowed, right? And uh, there weren't more shares. And so the lending fee was extremely high on the stock. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Um, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, I just mentioned I was paying 32% last week to short GameStop. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And, and you know, for, for the students out there, if you want to do something fun, go to your Google machine and, and hit up Conseco and Erwin Jacobs and Carl Icahn uh, back. That was a very interesting uh, scenario. It, Erwin Jacobs, actually, I think he took out a full page ad in the Wall Street Journal urging um, investors not to lend out their Conseco stock to short sellers like Carl Icahn. I mentioned that because Conseco stock, if memory serves, I think went from like $6 a share up to $19 or $20 a share, which back then was a big move. And Mr. Icahn wound up getting hurt on his short position. But he learned from that. And now if you go back and see, you know, Bill Ackman and Carl Icahn and Herbalife, the, the roles, the whole thing flipped. You know, Bill Ackman was a pretty... Um, pretty opinionated short in Herbalife. Carl Icahn took the other side. And I think Carl learned from, I don't want to make mistakes, but I think he learned from history. I mean, so this, if you think this just happened now, I don't think many people think this has happened all throughout history. And 
there's so many um, examples of this taking place. This just happens to be an example because social media played a role and, and other things. So, Chester, I want to go to you. I mean, regulators are going to get their arms around this. If you were Gary Gensler or whoever's going to walk in into the, into the um, Biden administration, you know, what, are you, what are you thinking about going into what is a fascinating time in markets? Well, I, I, w- I, w- I, w- I, w- I would be looking. For, I would be looking at a number of issues. I would be looking at making the lending, making lending markets much more transparent. I would be looking at what can we learn from the recent events about uh, both settlement and other aspects of the risk management structure and how leverage um, plays plays into that and how, how we can smooth out the risk management structure. Um, I would focus um, quite a bit on the conflicts of interest. Um, in the in the in the in the trading process, I I think in a way that's that's at the core of of how uh, competition can be improved. Those would be and and I would and I also would focus not only on our equity markets. I think that there's been not as much attention as desirable on our fixed income markets. If I look at the trading, if we look at the trading costs in fixed income, um, there's much more scope for improvement in fixed income trading costs than there than there is potential for improvement in equity trading costs. And by, by, by and large, that sort of, a, that seems to be a backwater. Um, not so much these days among academics, but still a backwater among regulators. Rena, I know you have thoughts. And when you get tapped by the Biden administration, because they should be knocking on your door, you know, what are your thoughts on all this? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with uh, everything that Chester is saying. Uh, I would also add to that, that there has to be more coordination amongst the regulators, right? Whether it's the SEC and CFTC and FSOC and Treasury, there, as we've seen with this saga also, there's an options piece to it. There's a synthetic short piece to it. So uh, the interconnectedness of markets is extremely important. So I hope, uh, and, and it's a great thing that Treasury Secretary uh, Yellen got all the regulators together uh, including the New York Fed. So I think this interconnectedness of the markets, that's very important that needs to be looked at. Jim. I think Rena raised a very important point. Because of the interconnected markets, we really don't have interconnected regulators the way we should. Our regulatory system kind of just grew through accretion over the last century. We really need to sit back and re-architect the structure of our regulatory agencies. Having a separate, separate regulator for commodities and insurance than for securities, no oversight at the federal level of insurance. You know, this is a completely dysfunctional structure. We need to basically rethink how we do all financial services regulation. And it's not going to happen quickly, but we need to start the conversation. So let so me we, make a point. May I make a point about please, this? Please, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, Gary Gensler uh, used to be the head of the CFTC under the Obama administration. Uh, now he's been proposed as the head of the SEC. And traditionally, the CFTC has approached short selling much differently from the SEC. The SEC is very biased towards uh, the long side of the market. The CFTC, uh, which regulates futures markets, is kind of neutral with respect to longs and shorts because uh, all the futures contracts have one short for every long. uh, And there's a a, a balance there. Um, The SEC has historically been very slow to change, very slow to introduce new ideas, uh, and, and very much against, uh, I would say, reforms. Uh, so new ideas like futures trading and, and financial assets orig- originally uh, occurred through the uh, CFTC. So having multiple regulators has encouraged a certain amount of innovation in the past and also has resulted in different regulatory philosophies that we can uh, reconcile. Uh, and, and Gary Gensler, I guess, will have seen both sides of the coin <laughs> uh, by the time it's all over. So, no so this, question. So this is so this is one. This is one. This is perhaps one issue for the legislators to take on. The legislators could solve this issue, but the legislators have been at the core of the opposition to solving this issue, uh, in part because it is it is perceived currently that it's valuable to be a member of the Senate or House Agriculture Committee. Um, because of the supervision of the of the committee of the of the CFTC and the import of that for campaign uh, spending, that that's at the core uh, of of why the Obama administration did not did not push uh, on the merger uh, between the SEC and the CFTC in, in the Dodd Frank process. 
So this is a statement, not a question, but there's so much in this statement from David Papp and, that I think a lot, of, a lot of us will have comments on. So here I go. There can't be clutching of pearls when people who are only receiving a measly 20 basis points on their savings accounts start seeking yield in the equity markets. Oh, and of course, that goes away. Whilst pros are raising dirt cheap capital and levering up 10 times to make big bets and widening the equity gap. Amen. Let me tell you something. That, there's so much in there, David. But let, and, and I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of ats on the Twitter. And, but I know our panelists have thoughts. But this, the, 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 the gap, the wealth gap in this country, in my opinion, has never been greater. And that, to me, lies at the foot of the Federal Reserve that has had 12, 13 years now of zero interest rate policies. And they've led to this. So you're pushing people out the risk curve. History is littered with disastrous outcomes born of good intentions. And I think that's what you're seeing right now. Professor Agrawal, I go to you. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so the wealth gap, I think, is a huge, huge issue. And uh, COVID has only uh, made us realize that it's gotten wider instead of getting better. So in that sense, I think it is good to have a democratization of the markets. Uh, a lot of people have not benefited from the markets doing extremely well the last year or so. And the question is, why shouldn't they benefit? Why shouldn't they participate uh, uh, more actively? In addition to the funds they hold, or they might have uh, retirement accounts. So from that aspect, I'm uh, all for the retail investor participating in the market. And in the long run, we know the markets tend to go up. We know that the yield on the market, the returns in the market tend to be higher than uh, fixed income securities or treasuries or bonds. So but I think it's a great thing for the retail investor to participate in this market as much as possible. But, but uh, and I'm not saying the retail investor is uh, in any way uh, not informed, often they're very, very informed, but the ones who are not, just to make sure that the financial literacy is there, the kinds of things that Chester was talking about, we, we've got to make sure as, as finance becomes accessible to more, as stock market trading becomes accessible to more, we also have the financial literacy piece uh, so that uh, people know what they're getting into. Jim, I see you nodding your head. Well, uh, in this business, everybody talks their book, and I'm going to talk mine. Um, Do it. As an educator, one of the real drivers of the wealth gap is the lack of education. That uh, you know, I think we need to uh, seriously work on education in this country to make sure that everybody is not just financially literate, but also is equipped with the skills they need to prosper in the 21st century. Chester. You know, so I, I, I think an, an important question, so I, I agree with Rena and, and Jim's comments. I, I think an important question, Guy, that you, that you were raising um, concer concerns the, the role of Fed policy in the zero interest and the sort of zero interest rate environment that we had for a long time after 2008. And, you know, now again, we're going to have for a long uh, time. Well, I think these, are, these, are, these I think, are, 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 are real issues. There's very little discussion in society about the implications um, for, sa for, sa for savers. Saver savers are sort of just uh, shunted, 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 shunted aside, mm -hmm. except, except when they've shown the good judgment to invest in our capital markets. And then they've done very well. But, but, but the, role, the role of these in, of the interest rates and what is an appropriate exit strategy you know, we even today we hear I hear no discussion um, uh, in in the in the popular arena or, or coming out of the Fed with respect to the issue of exit any kind of serious discussion of exit strategy, and we know that after two thousand and eight there were a whole series of failed attempts, um, start, starting with Bernanke's attempt um, and the taper and the and the taper the taper tantrum in two thousand thirteen. You know, and then, you know, even going even so far as Chairman Powell's, uh, well, first Chairman Yellen and then Chairman Powell's eff efforts that blew up uh, at the end of 2018 and the start mm -hmm. of 2019. The issue of exit strategy, it's it, it's it's got to be it's got, it's an important issue for our society. Yeah, Pete, I want to come to you. But, uh, you know, I could do I could I could speak for an hour by myself about this in terms that I won't use on this podcast, but you talk about exit strategy, they don't have an exit strategy. This is 
Oh. You know, it's lick your finger and put it up in the air and figure it out. Because I tell you something, the strategy is they hope that they can navigate their way through this quickly. And I'll say this. You mentioned Jerome Powell in 2018. My opinion only. I will tell you that when he started talking about we're going to reduce our balance sheet and normalize rates, he was on the right course. And the only thing that stopped him was the fact that the stock market went down 19.9% from the middle of October until early December. He got spooked by the market. So there is no exit strategy because they've been beholden to a stock market, which they shouldn't even have on their radar screen. Chester, well, back to you. Well, well yeah, so the, I, think you're, I think these issues you're raising are, 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 incredibly, are incredibly important. Um, and and it's, it strikes me that there's a set of economic principles um, that, that many, many in the public arena don't, don't focus so much upon, which is sort of the idea of time, which is the idea of time consistency. Um, and, and in particular, with some of the types of interventions, um, it's also important to kind of to understand how is it that we're going to manage our way out of and, and not simply let the future take care of, of itself, because they, there are very, there are vast long run consequences that emerge. And no, indirectly, right. you know, GameStop, GameStop is just a symptom. I mean, I, I think of GameStop, frankly, as a very minor event, but it is kind of a symptom um, in, in, in a broader sense. Oh, so Professor Agarwal, we got to come back and do this again. Listen, the final few minutes, Pete, closing thoughts as we, because I want to be respectful of our one hour time. Well, uh, on this issue of exit strategy, the Fed has been laboring very hard to create inflation. And the biggest, one of the biggest threats I see on the horizon is what happens if they're actually more successful than they were planning to be? Um, and it's, it's quite possible that that could happen. Uh, maybe this year, maybe not this year, but at some point in the future. And when inflation starts rearing its ugly head, um, the bond market will start crashing. That will crash the stock market. It, it could be very ugly. And, and, the, and the Fed is very levered. It could be ugly for the Fed. So uh, some caution is in order. In the, hubris, the hubris to think that they somehow can control inflation is the same hubris that took place in the control room at Chernobyl when they took the reactor down and then tried to bring it back up and pulled control rod by control rod out one after another until there were none left. And then the reaction they wanted to get was 10 times worse and they couldn't control it. Chester, your final thoughts. Well, I think that's an interesting, I'll just conclude by saying, I think that's a very interesting, I think that's a very interesting uh, example. And I think, you know, I think today's panel has been very interesting. I've learned a whole a whole bunch and, and sort of understand better how, how a broad range of the issues involving our financial system and in, involving the state of our economy really all tied together. Jim. Yeah. GameStop uh, illustrates some of the leaks in our financial plumbing and we need to plug them up. We need to uh, you know, fix some of our rules like 15C3-3, 204, 606, and a few others to basically make our capital markets, which are already really good, even better. Rena, I see, watch this, by the way. We're going to get out of here an hour on the screws. Rena, close us out. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to uh, uh, go back to kind of where we started that in general, our capital markets, they, they've been working extremely well. You know, we didn't have the volume went up. We've had no glitches during all of COVID, including March uh, 2020, when there was tons of volatility. Uh, I do want to point out to people that the stock market is not the economy, but the stock market and the economy are tied together. Wall Street and Main Street, they are tied together. If Wall Street is not working well, then it's going to be very hard for Main Street to be working well, for jobs to be created, for innovation to happen. So I, I think this is all tied together. And sometimes people think like Wall Street is something completely different from the economy. And I, I get it that uh, people are suffering. Uh, employment is a problem and uh, people are suffering in many different ways and they don't see what is happening in the stock market. But I'd still make the point that the markets do need to work for all and finance need, needs to be available for all, just like education needs to be available for all, but these are all tied together. Well, I've enjoyed this a great deal. I'm, I'd love to come back and do a panel on wealth inequality and, and what the root cause of it is and education is part, I get all those things, but the hour is come and gone like this. Chester, thank you. Peter, thank you. Jim, thank you. Rena, thank you. Thank you for the over, I think at 1.700 participants we had. Thank you for your time. 
from the greatest university, not only in the United States, but in the world, Georgetown University. Thank you all and hope to see you again soon. And thank you.